Hi and welcome back to a new video today, another Hardware Legends video series video and uh, probably the first one on our English channel. All the previous videos of this uh, series you can probably find on the main channel. Maybe if you want to check out these go back to the main channel but obviously all the following English videos of the Hardware Legends series will also be uploaded on this channel. And um, because I got some info material from Intel last week about the Intel 4004 because the CPU is turning 50 years old. Exactly 50 years ago, today on the 15th of November, Intel started offering and selling the 4004. And back then, this is one of the Intel 404 CPUs, tiny and just looks like a random IC. Could be any IC and could be one of those 50 cent ICs, but this one is about 200 to $300 right now. Anyway, these ICs were launched on the 15th of November, exactly 50 years ago. Back then Intel was quite small, they had about 100 employees and now it's about 110,000 worldwide, which I guess makes Intel one of the biggest companies on the planet. And I'm pretty sure that back then nobody of them would have thought that this would change the world that much, this tiny thing. I guess they also didn't think that they would have the power consumption we're seeing nowadays. Just a joke. Since Intel sent this info material to me last week, I thought it would be a, a good idea to shoot a video about the first Intel CPU commercially ever made available, which is the 4004. And my original plan was also to do die shots of the CPU and like delete the CPU, decap the CPU, which seems to be rather difficult because of the like epoxy case. I could probably mechanically grind the CPU and see how deep we can go until we can find the IC which should sit somewhere in the center. But then, yeah, not sure if that's a good idea, if we can get useful information out of this. Because in the end I also thought about sending those to Tescan to get an analysis of like the transistor count, transistor size compared it to a nowadays CPU. But that seems to be a, di a bit difficult because of the epoxy package of this CPU because this one, the, the black one, is just the typical DIP, dual inline package, dip package uh, CPU, which is very common for any kind of random cheap ICs nowadays. But it's probably difficult to reach the IC which is sitting in the center. I also have this original 404 which is sitting inside a ceramic case. This CPU is much more rare, it's also much more expensive than this one. Those black ones are available if you look on eBay somewhere between like, I don't know, like 200 or 300 dollar. And those, depending on the condition and also on the model year, because if I look on the back side, it's reading 7550, which stands for model year 75, it's pretty much the batch number, and the week 50. So this one is not from 1971, but it's from 1975. It's still quite old and it's still in the original ceramic case with all those gold plating around it. And these price-wise, yeah, something between $2,000 and $4,000 depending on the exact condition. The 4004 originally came up because the company Busycom ordered them from Intel in 1969 for calculators, like desk calculators, huge machines, basically a calculator that adds up your stuff on paper. The Intel 404 was used in the Busycom 141PF, which was sold in the US as NCR1836. Originally Busycom ordered 12 different ICs from Intel because they thought they need 12 different ICs for the 141PF, but Intel said they can do this with only four different pieces. These four chips were the 4001, 4002, 4003 and 4004. The 4001 was a 2048-bit read-only memory, a ROM. The 4002 was a 320-bit memory module. And the 4003 was a 10-bit register. Now 50 years later, Intel knows that this was probably the best or the most important product they ever made, at least looking at the history. Back then, Intel was only in the market for about three years and they designed it for Busycom, which meant they also owned the property, the intellectual property of the chip design. But Intel decided, and that was probably a very, very smart move, probably the best move in the company history, they bought back the rights of the chip design for about 60,000 US dollar. Looking back, that was probably a bargain. 
The successor was only produced in 1974 and was called the 4040. And Intel generally manufactured the 4004 until 1981. And by the way, they also used these ICs in the first pinball machines. Looking at the technology of the 4004, the CPUs were available from clocks starting at 500 kHz going up to 740 kHz. And they were also only 4-bit CPUs, while everything we have today is a 64-bit CPU. And talking about the manufacturing of the CPUs, those used 10 micrometer PMOS. And 10 micrometer equals 10,000 nanometer. Already that gives you kind of an impression that there is a huge difference in the manufacturing process. But looking at a transistor count, this entire chip contains 2,300 transistors. And now looking at a 12900K, for example, which is using Intel 7, it has 100 million transistors per square millimeter. That, that is just completely insane. And also looking at the mechanics, this is using 16 pins. Well, nowadays we have 1700 pins. If you would try to open the case of the 404 in like an elegant way, you would probably use some nitric acid to dissolve parts of the case. But since the fumes of those acids are extremely toxic and dangerous, I don't really want to do that right here in my home. So I will just grind it down a little bit and see how far we can get and what kind of, I don't know, images, exposures we can get. I know the CPU looks like it's in a terrible state right now. It probably also is. But I'm just in between the, the lapping and grinding process. It's been about 20 minutes so far. And in the center you can see some of those tiny gold spots. Those should be the bond wires, which are attaching or connecting the pins to the chip in the center. Also, I'm grinding a bit uneven. The pin on the right side is already partially exposed, while bottom left is not exposed at all. Now even more of the pins are exposed and we can also see that parts of the chip are getting exposed but I'm a bit worried about the state of the chip if I keep grinding that I'm eventually also or directly also removing the circuit on top. We will find out. Worst case, I have to order a second one. Most of the chip is now exposed but I think we also removed most of the circuit on the chip. At least if you think about that you would have those tiny bond wires going to the chip directly. I don't think there's much left, but let's keep going. Apart from the fact that I think this looks pretty nice, we won't be able to see any kind of circuit. The grinding method is simply not the good method for exposing any kind of dip packaging. But we can still see how it looks inside, which I think is still somehow interesting. Looking at the pins going from the side to the center, then we would have those tiny gold wires going from the pins to the chip itself. That's just the part in the center. But yeah, for die shots, we would have to find a different method because I think everything that was part of the circuit is now gone. I want to highlight that I just bought this, the black version, because of this video, because I knew that, or I expected that this would not work out on the first attempt. It was still kind of interesting to me if you have a good idea how to do this. Of course, the last option is probably nitric acid. If you have a different way how we could approach this, please let me know because then I would probably buy a second one and then we can do proper die shots and also the SEM analysis together with Tescan. Please let me know in the comments and thanks for tuning in to this video. See you next time. Bye.